<laughs> Welcome back to Triple M Podcast. I'm your host, Crystal. And I'm Felicia. And today we're going to be talking about... The real Ebenezer Scrooge. The real Ebenezer Scrooge. Happy early Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy... Hanukkah? Hanukkah. Happy... Um, my birthday? <laughs> happy Potato Fee's birthday! Yeah, those are all the only important things that happened this month. You know, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, my birthday. That's it. Yes. Um, so we are so excited for Christmas around here. We hope that you guys are too. If Yay, you can, commercialism. Right? If you can, we're going to post some um, videos of us caroling. Oh, my <laughs> out God. And about. I did not agree to Watch that. Watch out for that on social media if Crystal agrees. She ain't got no choice. Oh she God. won't know what's happening <laughs> until it's out there. God dang it. I <laughs> swear to God, if you put pictures of me on social media, caroling, I'm not doing it. I'm You're not, not doing it? it? I'm going to be Ebenezer Scrooge You won't now. know. Bah humbug. You won't know. All right. Well. You won't know until it's done. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to go have a fight in the backyard. We'll be back shortly. All right. Bets on who? I want to hear what your money is. We'll let you know afterwards. <laughs> Submit that in. Yeah, just pretend like you haven't seen pictures of us. Hi, guys. Welcome to our podcast. Mental Miss and Mysteries. It's all right. It's okay. But you should listen anyway. For the holidays, Triple M is showcasing local artists from around the world. You can check out our Facebook page at Mental Miss and Mysteries, or you can find us on Insta at Mental Mysteries, and you can see that art. Today, we don't have any art to display for you, so we are sponsoring Fruitcake. That's right, everybody. Your favorite holiday dessert, Fruitcake. If you uh, log on to Fruitcake.com, you can put in code myths and get fruitcake fruitcake for, for free fa- yes free fruitcake for the holidays for your family for your mother <laughs> for your grandmother that stepmother aunts uncles nieces nephews not if your you, husband if you pay an extra 10 percent, then we'll have somebody who is a little fruity Give deliver you. your fruitcake by hand in their hands open hand just in their hands just in time for Corona. Just in time for the holidays. So if you love fruitcake and you just can't not get enough, go ahead and log into fruitcake.com and enter code MIFS to get your free fruitcake. Free fruitcake for everybody. <laughs> Woo! Oh, wait. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and you know what goes best with fruitcake? What? Good Christmas movies. Yeah, like like, what? like classics such as you know a Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. How many of you guys love a Christmas Carol? We love it. Yay! Yay. Actually, it's not even on my top ten holiday movies, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a. <laughs> What's your favorite holiday movie? Die Hard. Die Hard. Of Die course. Hard is the shit. <laughs> I like uh, the one with the heat miser. The heat miser and Frosty. I'm Mr. White Christmas. Yes. I think that's my favorite one. The one where Santa Claus goes and... Yeah, it's like the really old school one. Yes. And they live in that really small town and none of the kids get toys. Yes. Yes. I love it. That whole series of old... Isn't that that the Island of Misfit toys? Because that's my favorite Christmas They're different ones. I don't think they're Are they two different ones? Yes. I love both of them, though. They're all the same... um, The same actors and they're all the same... Um, animation style right but there's like a whole like that whole series is great i love it and then frosty the snowman's a classic um, yeah frosty's great least favorite christmas movie oliver the other reindeer oh i don't oh i think i've seen that one maybe it's about a dog who thought he was a reindeer because he's like olive the other reindeer <laughs> oh. and the dog's name is olive and i was like that's, it was one of those like really cringy that sounds really corny cringy. there's also a eddie murphy movie i used to watch all the time what is it called? Trading Places? Oh, when I he becomes rich? Yes. yes. And I think that's set during Christmas time. It is. So they typically like release it during Christmas. It's when he's like first out in front of the building pretending like he's got no legs. Yes. And then he becomes the CEO because the dad's trying to like punish his son or whatever. They, well, there's two men had a bet. Oh, they had a bet. Yeah, they bet a dollar. Oh, that's right. They, they did bet have a dollar. A bet. <laughs> To see if they could turn him into a CEO. And they 
<laughs> but that is so fucked up. And yeah, like, it is so fucked really up. Really lets yes. you see the mind of society. I know. <laughs> White men. <laughs> but shout out to Eddie Murphy, one of my um, inspirations for being comedic in life. Eddie yeah. Murphy, he had a great list of like, he has a great catalog. Oh, yeah, he does. And his acting is so versatile. Right. Um, he can go from really raunchy, raunchy to like family comedy to yeah. serious. To, what's the one where he plays a guru? That is one of my favorites. Oh, I can't think of it. I think it's just because he's so down to earth. Yeah. It's like a big reason that I love Will Smith, too. Like, they're just such down to earth people. I have opinions. About it. You don't like Will? No, I like Will Smith. Are you on Jada's side? I don't, li- I don't like. Happen. I don't like Jada. You don't all. like Jada? No. Why not? Because of the whole entanglement thing. Because, or just her whole. She's like a lead singer of a metal rock band. <laughs> she's awesome. She, I just don't. She just gives me like fake vibes. Like I mean, I feel like she's really she full of herself. Went to school for like all of those people were kind of pompous. Um, Will Smith doesn't come across this way. But he, that's not that's not his thing though. He didn't start off in that. She's tr- or like traditionally classically trained in that. I hate to go astrological because I always do, but always. you got to get used to it. But she's a Virgo. Virgos think they're the shit. Amy. They Virgo stands for virgin, which is not actually about virginity, it's about purity. And so they think that they are more pure and clean and perfect than everyone else in the world. That just sounds like any lady out of church. Any of I the old know. church ladies. Virgos are particularly bad about it because they're really opinionated. Like, and they just, I could just, I just get those vibes from her on her show. Like she's, I haven't watched the Red Table Talk. I feel like she has this very like false sense of security. Like she really cares about you, but I think it's less that she actually cares and more that she just wants to be in people's business. I mean, maybe. But, like, that's her show. She needs to be in people's and, business. And, like, all the clips I've seen of her and Will on the show together, I just get this vibe that she just disrespects him and he just tolerates it. Like, There's a good chance that's happening. Yeah, like, she just doesn't value him. Like, it's clear that she's, like, the alpha male in their relationship. But there, like, must be a reason, because he's not not shy from divorce, though. So like, I think he's just mature. Yeah. I think he's just too mature for that. Like, I, he doesn't seem to me to the type to, like, necessarily be submissive. But when you're good-hearted, people who want to dominate take advantage of you. And I think he's good-hearted, and he's too mature, and he probably wants to stay together for the kids. Mm-hmm. Some kids are old enough. Fuck them kids. I don't know. Them kids over here doing weird shit. Like, they don't need their parents. Anyway, I don't know how we got on Jada or Will or any of that. Oh, uh, my comedic, um, whatever, um, influencers. Right. Yeah. But you know what's about to be my new favorite Christmas movie? What? Wonder Woman 1984. Yeah? It comes out Christmas Day. What did I... I saw something about... um, Somehow you could dress up as Wonder Woman on Facebook or something. Like they have a new avatar thing. Like for your um, bitmojis? Yeah, I think that's what it was. Bitmojis, yes. So you can practice. I want to do that. I might, once like cons are back up and running, I might cosplay. I'm saying, have you cosplayed her before? No, I've only cosplayed. I've done All Might from My Hero Academia. I've done Garnet from Steven Universe. And I've done B from Being Puppy Cat. And Levi from my, oh, sorry, Attack on Titan. You did leave, did you show me your picture of you? I don't have pictures of, because I did Uh, did two cosplays that, um, for that weekend. So Garnet was my main one. Levi is the one I did for the uh, aquarium mixer. So part of the thing is we went to the aquarium after Uh, hours and there was like a cocktail bar. And Ooh, that sounds like some fancy nerdy stuff I would love to be into. It was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Dope. You could totally be Wonder Woman. I want to. Um, that's the Wonder Woman and Sailor Moon are my next two. Yeah? Yes. What do you like about Wonder Woman? I just like how powerful she is, but how pure she Like, she's powerful and great and just like a really great icon, but she's not, it doesn't get to her head. Yeah. She's not full of herself. Like she's she under, She understands her weaknesses. She understands her problems. Aww. She doesn't try to like like some of the other heroes where they have like a sense that, of justice where, do you see yourself in her no no you i don't see think myself that... in sailor moon <laughs> do you yeah she cries a lot 
<laughs> she oh likes to eat and sleep. <laughs> okay, so maybe Sailor Moon is the you that you are, and Wonder Woman is the you that you would strive to be. Either way, they get the job. <laughs> At the end of the day, Sailor Moon still saves the day. Yeah. She just eats, they're just eats. <laughs> you just have to lead her to the path of... Of righteousness. Yeah, she will complain and whine and cry and gawk over boys. And <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Wonder Woman um, will be the Christmas movie of the year, huh? Right. Are you going to pay that 30 bucks on Netflix to, like, rent it at home? I was going to... It's coming out on HBO Max. Oh, okay. So I'm going to try to get a free trial because I haven't done that free trial yet. Do you get to just watch it for free on there, though? Because I'm, Netflix, even when they release, like, a movie or whatever... You still have to pay the $30 if it's one that's supposed to have been in theaters if COVID didn't exist or whatever. I mean, I might pay the $30 if I get everybody to sit down and watch it together as a family. And yeah. they all shut up and watch it together. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen um, the multiple versions of The Scrooge? Like, which one is your favorite? If I seen like the... There was one we went to go see in theaters. And this is probably why it's my favorite because, like, the last time we went to theaters together uh-huh. as a family, one of my brothers is... Autistic, and he can't do movie theaters. Right. So we probably... Except they have autistic movie show times now at a lot of theaters. They do? What does that mean? Because he just can't go into the theater. Oh, well, they just, like... It's early in the morning, usually. They keep the, like... Lights on? The tickets low. They lowered, like, they change a lot of the sensory stuff. They don't make the sound too loud. Because like, it's just, like, about going into the dark theater that he doesn't like. Like, he can do it I now. They might keep the lights up. I don't know. It's really cool. But I think it's AMC that I heard about that does it. They do, mm-hmm. like, morning matinees, and they call it, like, sensory or something. I don't know what they do. but You might have to check that out. Well, he can go in now. Like, the last movie we He's saw was Sonic. But, yeah. like, from before, after that, we just did straight drive-in theaters. If we wanted to watch a movie, we go catch the double feature at the drive-in. So you saw the Scrooge at the drive-in? This is the last one we saw in theaters. Oh, okay. So he was able to go. We had to like coax him into going. And he Which one was movie. that? It's the 3D one. The one where it's like that weird CGI animation where he like the same thing with Polar Express. Oh, where it's that kind of animation. Who's the actors in that one? I can't remember. I so just, my favorite one is like the old one from the 80s that has. Um, Gosh darn it, I knew I wasn't going to be able to remember his name. But he's a super funny comedian, and he was super popular, and, and he's, like, angry the whole the whole time. And they're, like, bringing back the ghost of Christmas past or whatever mm-hmm. on him. And then there's always the Mickey one, which I saw when I was, like, a kid. Muppet? Is it a Muppet one? I, no, I just know there's one where Mickey Mouse is the little boy that, like... Is crippled or whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's a Muppets one. one too. Is there? That one's that one's second. That one's the best. There's so many. Well, I'm it, whichever one that you love, just know that we're getting ready to run it for you. We're not gonna ruin it per se. <laughs> we're just gonna like give you some backstory. Because actually right. the real Ebenezer Scrooge wasn't a Scrooge towards other people. We're gonna find that out. We're gonna find that out. So I am excited to potentially psychoanalyze what mental health disorder he might have been struggling with. Scroogeness. Scroogeness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's hear it. All right. John Elvis, born in 1714, was born John Meggett. He was orphaned at an early age. His father, a wealthy London brewer named Robert Meggett, died when the boy was only four. His mother, Amy Elvis, followed not too long after. When she died, the family fortune, an estimated 100,000 euros, or in today's time, $29 million. Wow. Yeah. And he was four? He was four. Wow. Passed to her son, the four-year-old. Holy cow. Mm-hmm. Did they just get, like, the plague or something? Doesn't say. It's the 1700s. It could have been just old. <laughs> well, if he was only four, though, and they died back to back. I'm thinking, I don't know. Okay. It's anyway. in London. They dirty. Yeah, they're dirty. <laughs> No offense to our Londoners out there. I was say, that sounded very offensive to Londoners. Hey, every time I talk to people like who are in Europe, like, it's filthy here. It's gross and <laughs> disgusting and nasty. Okay, all right. John was, educated the we- John was educated at the Westminster School, an exclusive boarding school in Westminster Abbey in London. He spent more than a decade there, then lived in Switzerland for a few years before returning to England. When he was in his 20s and 30s, Megat gave little hint of the man he would become. He dressed well, spent money freely, and moved among London's most fashionable circles. Wait, 
did you cite your oh story? yeah i got this from nitarama.com and it was written by miss selenia on Monday, November 5th, 2012. I thought <laughs> <laughs> like a miscellaneous. <laughs> Is that what that stands for? Miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. Okay. So he wasn't like in his early days, he wasn't a, like he wasn't stingy. He dressed okay. really well. He liked to spend money. He liked to eat good food. You like to hang out with people and like do fun stuff. Okay. He developed a taste for French wines and fine dining. Okay. He was a skilled horseman and a fox hunter, and he had a passion for gambling. He bet and often lost thousands, thousands of pounds in card games. Okay. That all sounds really not super healthy. I mean, technically, no. Right. But when your parents died, and you have no guidance. So he wasn't stingy in the sense that he wasn't stingy with himself, because it sounds like most of that is just him spending money on himself. But we haven't gotten to here okay. yet. So apparently... Mm-hmm scrooginess or stinginess or miserness mm. we're going to call them misers okay. runs in the family oh okay unfortunately for megat hoarding money seems to have run in the family at least on his mother's side if contemporary accounts are to be believed amy elvis went to her early grave because she refused to dip into the family fortune to buy food and literally starved herself to death <laughs> what the <laughs> What? You're going to see that pop up a lot about okay. the weird not wanting to buy food. That thing. is some definite mental disorder. Her brother, Harvey, was a miser on his own right. He lived on a country estate inherited from his father's side of the family. And though he would grow his inheritance to more than 250,000 euros or 70, 72 million dollars. Wow. He allowed the estate itself to fall into ruin. The manor house's roof leaked and Ray Ronder stained the crumbled, the crumbling mildewed walls broken windows were repaired with paper and the furniture was infested with worms wow i want to kind of try to shed a positive light on this by comparing it to like steve jobs who wears goodwill jeans right Mm -hmm. but clearly they are beyond this is beyond and we're heading into and it almost i'm already kind of getting a feel for the mental disorder you're that's gonna, going on do you want do you want me to tell you now or wait you're gonna i want you to wait to see okay. what inevitably happens to um john elvis himself okay all right so rather than buying his own clothes uncle harvey wore the old clothes of the door of the dead relative who left him his fortune and like his sister he hated buying food he spent his days wandering the estate hunting partridges and small games that he could eat for free. Sounds genius. On cold evenings, he kept warm by pacing back and forth in the great hall of his drafty mansion, rather than waste wood on fire. Wow. Too cheap to marry, he lived like a hermit for more than 50 years. To avoid the expense of company, not surprisingly, he produced no heirs. Wow. Yes. Since Harvey had no children, John hoped to inherit his uncle's fortune. That's why in 1751, he changed his last name from Megat to Elwes to assure his uncle that the family name would survive. That's also why Elwes visited his uncle regularly and pretended to share his miserly ways. Before arriving at his uncle's estate, where the mills were certain to be meager, he'd drop, on, he'd drop in on a friend and fill up on their food. Then he'd stop at a roadside inn to change out of his fashionable clothes into the tattered garments he kept for that purpose. He continued <laughs> to his uncle's. He sounds really smart. Right. For dinner, Elvis and Uncle Harvey ate whatever fish, partridge, or other small game Harvey managed to kill that day. As they ate, they talked about money and how others wasted it. They wow. There they would sit, saving souls with a single stick upon the fire and a worth one glass of wine occasionally betwixt them. So they would share basically one glass of right. wine. Right, got it. Talking of the extravagance of the time, Elwes' friend and biographer Edward Toffin wrote, when evening shut, they were retired to rest as going to bed saved candlelight. Okay, so this is the 1700s. Yes. And they're ta- he's talking about the, um, what was the word he used about spending a lot of money? Extravagance? Extravagance. Okay, so they're talking about the extravagance. I wish I knew more about history so I could understand, like, what was going on during that time that seemed so extravagant. People like, were eating food at restaurants, not prepared <laughs> by themselves. People wore new clothes that they bought, and they rented carriages. They paid to ride in a carriage. Do you think that Those are this uncle was a Capricorn? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's 
sporting all the money. He sounds like he's like people are wasting their money on heat and food. What is this atrocity? What is your? Why are you eating? Why are you eating? Who needs your body? Eat yourself. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> eat yourself. If this doesn't like speak to the money being the root of all evil or something like what is he gonna do with the money he can't eat it he can't burn it he can't he can't do anything he can't enjoy life because he doing, doesn't have enough ridiculous and 70 million something dollars okay so john i don't know what t- toe dying means but it's here john's years of toe dying paid off when Harvey died in September 1763, he Someone left... Someone can spoon feed us the definition of, of toe, toe dying. dying. Thank you. He left his nephew, now in his late 40s, his entire fortune. John Elwes was now worth over 350,000 euros, the equivalent of more than $100 million today. Wow. By then, Elwes had assumed most of his uncle's habits, but not all of them. He still had expensive tastes, and as long as someone else paid the bill, he happily indulged in them, gorging himself at other people's tables as he warmed himself for free by their fires. He loved to gamble huge sums of money in card games. He gladly lent huge sums to friends and associates when asked, no matter how frivolous the purpose. If hmm. the borrowers defaulted, Iris never demanded repayment, explaining that it was impossible to ask a gentleman for money. Wow. But... Where his own comfort and material well-being were concerned, Illis would not part with a penny. Where once he dressed in rags only to impress his uncle, he now wore them all the time and never cleared his shoes that might wear them out faster. So he never cleaned his shoes off. So he like slowly spent enough time with his uncle that he became his uncle yes. to a degree. Wow. Friends said that he looked like a prisoner confined for debt. Like his uncle, Elvis allowed his estate to fall into ruin. He refused to buy a carriage and wondered how anyone could think that he, anyone can think he could afford one. Riding a horse was cheaper, especially the way he did it. Before setting off on a journey, he'd fill his pockets with hard-boiled eggs so he wouldn't have to pay for meals and taverns. He rode in the soft dirt by the side of the road rather than on the road itself so that he wouldn't have to buy horseshoes for his horses. He traveled oh out. My God. <laughs> right. He traveled hours out of the way to avoid toll toll roads. If he needed to stop for a night, he'd find a spot by the side of the road that had a lot of grass so that his horse could eat for free and sleep beneath a tree to save the price of a room at an inn. Wow. This is so interesting. (laughs) I just don't even have much commentary because I'm just so shocked. He was an interesting man. Clearly. Elwes's mania for frugality extended to his own family. I love that they refer to it as mania. Because it is. Yeah. It's definitely a mania. He had two sons out of wedlock because marriage costs money. <laughs> he wow. refused to pay for their education. Putting things in the people's head, he explained, was a sure way to take money out of their pockets. Jesus. In 1774, Elvis was offered a chance to succeed a retiring member of par- Parliament in the British House of Commons and accept it, provided that he wouldn't have to spend any money on his campaign. He just spent 18 cents on a meal for himself and won the election. <laughs> oh, my God. Politics didn't change him, though. During his 12 years in office, Elvis dressed shabbily and as, as he ever had. He walked everywhere, even in the rain, to save the cost of sharing a coach with other MPs. He looked so destitute tramping around London that people often stopped him on the street to force pennies into his hand. Wow. If he arrived home drenched from the downpour, like his Uncle Harvey, he'd sit in his wet clothes rather than light a fire. Mm-hmm. Yet, even though Elvis lived in frugality, he continued to lend generously to friends and invest in their, in their speculative ventures. In all, it estimated that he's lost, he lost the sum of 150,000 euros in bad loans and investments. No matter his fortune kept growing. By the mid 1780s, he was worth nearly one thousand. I'm sorry, one million euros, which or is two hundred ninety million. Wow. Our money. In 1784, Elvis retired from Parliament rather than spend even a pay- a pence on what would have been a certain re-election. With the distraction of public office gone from his life, his penny pinching intensified. His diet suffered most of all. On an occasion, he ate a dead bird that a rat had dragged out of a river. Ah, on one occasion, he ate a dead bird that a rat had dragged out of a river. On another, he caught a fish with a partially eaten smaller fish in his stomach. I, this was killing two birds with one stone, he said. 
Then he ate them both. Wow. On those rare occasions when Elvis bought lamb or other meat from the butcher, he bought the entire animal to get the best price and then ate every bit of it. In an age before refrigeration, this meant he often ate meat that had reached the last stage of putrefaction. Right, yeah. Meat that would walk out of his plate would he continue to eat it rather than have a new thing killed before the old provision was finished. Yeah, because he's so obsessed with saving money. He he had... Why didn't he just cook it all first? Well, where would he store the cooked meat? Huh. Because that would go bad too, wouldn't it? I mean, I guess. Yeah. You could dry it all out. That would be less likely to go bad. That means he has to build a whole thing to dry it out. That sounds like money. <laughs> he has to salt it. He probably ate with no seasonings. Yeah, probably. Seasonings were expensive, you know? Ellis had inherited several properties in London, and he added to their number until he owned more than 100. Keeping them rented took work, and yet, for all the time it was spent in London, he never set up a household for himself. He and the old woman who served as his cook and maid stayed in whichever of his properties was vacant, but only as long as it took to find a new tenant. Their household possessions were limited to a bed for himself and one for the maid, a table, and a couple of chairs. When a tenant was found, sometimes after Elvis and his maid spent just a night or two in the place, they packed their things and moved to another vacant property. Wow. He was house hopping in houses he already owned. <laughs> what? He... <laughs> I don't understand. He owned 100 houses, 100 different properties. He was renting them out, and instead of just staying one and making it his home... He would just live in ones that were vacant until they were being rented out. That's genius. But sometimes for one or two days. I mean, it's genius. Is it you're genius? Trying to, if you're trying to save money. That's insane. <laughs> you already own 100 properties. Just live in one. But that would be a waste to him in his mind. In his mind. So he had a bed and a bed for his maid, a table and a couple of chairs that they have to move. And they just moved. Con- and his maid just moved with him. All yes. The, time. the constant moving almost cost Elvis his life. Once when he and his maid both fell deathly ill at the same time. Nobody, I'm sure they did. <laughs> nobody knew where they were. Luckily for Elvis, his nephew went looking for him and found a boy who's seen a poor man enter one of Elvis's property on Great Marlborough Street. The nephew rushed there and found Elvis near death. He was too late to save the maid. Her body was found in another room. She had been dead for two or three days. Wow. He basically killed his maid. Wow. He killed his maid. Because no one, because if you don't have a home that people can find you. (laughs) Wow. Elvis recovered physically from the ordeal, but his mental state already declining due to his penurious lifestyle and advancing age got worse. His obsession with money narrowed until he became fixated on the change he had in his pocket. He'd wrap up each coin in a piece of paper and hide it somewhere in his rooms, then stay up half the night wandering the house in an agitated state, trying to remember where he had hidden the coins. (laughs) Jesus Christ! In time, he he came to believe that the change was all the money he had in the world. Terrified of dying penniless, he often woke up in the middle of the night screaming at imaginary thieves. So he's totally delusional, which he, is what happens in this show. He becomes so obsessive, he becomes delusional. Yeah, he's he's gone. Yeah. I will keep my money. I will. Nobody shall rob me of my property. In November 1789, Elvis fell ill and took to his bed. He died eight days later. I hope I have left you what you wish, he told one of his sons before he died. He probably did. Each of them inherited Nearly 500,000 euros apiece, or $145 million. Mm, okay. As far as anyone knows, neither of them became misers. Because <laughs> they were like, <laughs> thank God. Fuck that. Edward Hoffman, fascinated by his friend's odd lifestyle, in 1790, he wrote The Life of the Late John Elvis Esquire. The book was a bestseller with 12 printings by 1805. Its success inspired other books and articles on Elvis's name soon became a household around. I'm sorry. His name became household around the world. And that's how he became Scrooge. Yes. Ebenezer Scrooge. He was synonymous with penny pinching. I, so I wonder where the whole thing about like him owning factories or not paying people or not letting people borrow money and little kids starving came from. Because it well, doesn't sound like he's really involved in all of that. Right. He's kind of just kept to himself. Charles Dickens knew the story and mentioned Elvis in both a letter and his 1865 novel, Our Mutual Friend. 
Though he apparently never said so explicitly, explicitly, Dickens is widely believed to have modeled Ebenezer Scrooge, the miser in A Christmas Carol, on Ellis. Oh, okay. The artwork in the first edition of the story, published in 1843, bears this out. Dickens worked closely with his illustrator to create images of his character that were exactly as he envisioned them. And the Ill- illustrations of Ebenezer Scrooge bears a striking resemblance to John Ellis. Wow. I think he, you know, he took some artistic liberty. Do you have some pictures of him, I'm Mr. Sure. Ellis, that we can put up on social media for people? I do not. The article has a picture, but it's, like, not popping up. So I'm oh. going to find some pictures of John we Ellis. We will find some pictures for you to see how much he looks like Mr. Scrooge. Do I get to psychoanalyze him now? I'm so excited. You get to psychoanalyze him now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm pretty sure my theory is right, and I think that Mr. Ellis was struggling with hoarding disorder. But uh, I think... He was hoarding money? That his primary hoard was money. hmm And I think that because it was clear that he was so obsessive with his money that just the feeling of parting with any of it became like a conscious anxiety, which drove him to psychosis and delusion in older age. Another reason I think that is because a lot of people that are hoarders, let's say they get into a close relationship with someone else, that that other person starts out to be kind of like an enabler. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately they fall into that same cycle. So like his Uncle Harvey? Of hoarding, right? So when he first started, maybe his compulsions or obsessions, because they used to believe that hoarding was just a version of obsessive compulsive disorder now it has its own diagnosis in the dsm but some of the symptoms overlap right so maybe his first compulsions were gambling like he clearly has some risky compulsions gambling he likes to drink a lot so he was kind of hoarding items and then it sounds like his uncle kind of convinced him that this is the way that the real thing you should be hoarding is money yeah and not all these other things. And um, another thing that I want to talk about when you talk about dispelling myths with hoarders, because a lot of people treat hoarders like they're just subclass humans and they're not really dealing with something, you know, but you have to treat this like you would any other mental disorder and people deserve treatment. And so um, it also like really because there's different types of hoarders. I was experience some hoarding not mm-hmm. hoarding in my life but like people around especially kids i went to school there was a kid who just his parents were hoarders mm-hmm. or at least one of them and like that whole house mm-hmm. was unlivable and that's affecting not only your mental health that's affecting you physically and yeah and your family and everyone around you and you basically can't live it's extremely debilitating you're obsessed with keeping your possessions and yeah. that's all you think about and all you do it becomes a level of hyper focus, which leads me to new research showing that this can be a comorbid problem with attention deficit disorder because people with ADHD cannot focus on one thing, which explains moving around a lot, him having no problem with that. He can right. do lots of different things. He doesn't have any stability in his life, but then he can also become hyper focused. And then his hyper focus becomes on those compulsions. Um, One of my great, my favorite hoarders episodes is about this nurse. She was an ER nurse and I see myself in her. And I think that's why it's one of my favorites. But she was so obsessed with hoarding because she thought she could make money from it. Mm -hmm. And so she would pick up tons of stuff and she would take it back to her house. And she filled up three houses full of stuff that she would then post on Craigslist and she was going to make money. And it just became this way to like hyper focus in because she didn't have the ability to do that at the ED. So it was like she was treating herself that way. And there's been some brain scans done of people that are struggling with hoarding disorders. And apparently there's a primary um, part of the brain called the cingulate cortex Um, or the anterior cingulate cortex, and it's associated with decision-making error monitoring, and that's like you monitoring your own, you know, making of errors, and reward-based learning. Um, So decision-making is something that people with ADD and OCD tend to struggle with, 
is the decision making, right? So people with ADHD tend to more often struggle with not being able to make a decision at all. And people with OCD um, are obsessed about like how to make that decision or what to do. And it, and it comes across the same way with the hyper focus with ADHD. So just kind of knowing that um, that activation of that part of the brain is lower in people that are dealing with hoarding disorder kind of helps us to destigmatize it because we understand that there's some functional differences that are going on with the brain. And another reason that kind of led me to think that this was the problem, right, is because it seems genetic. Right, his mother, his uncle. Yeah, and then himself. Mm -hmm. And so he probably already had some propensities for that behavior, and then it just got worse when he began to associate with his uncle, right? Because he's already out gambling and doing some of those, like... Risky. Risky, kind of manic, um, impulse control problems like so. lending all his friends lending people that much money right that's a pro- that's an issue 150,000 euros or whatever that would be in our time nearly 70 or 80 million dollars right and bad investments to your friends and like mm-hmm. that's ridiculous and it sounds like you know part of it was like I can't spend this money on myself because then that would make me frivolous but helping other people is okay because that's not a frivolous and I still have enough money that I can maintain safety and it was an opportunity to make money I think he saw it as like I'm putting money into this but this can come back as more right money. which is probably part of the impulses with the gambling right. and everything well, that's really sad. I mean, I guess it's cool for the bloodline that they amassed so much money, but I just find it horrible that his uncle lived so poorly for 50 poorly years. Poorly for basically so, I mean, he in was solitude. Just, yeah, and just deprived from like what I would consider a rewarding life, um, you know, being able to have real connections and love and a family and maybe children and I think it'd be interesting to see, and we'll have to look this up, but, like, he served on Parliament for 12 years. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, maybe he felt like he was getting enough connection there, but... And he had two sons. Like, he... Elvis himself, John Elvis himself, he had two sons. Yeah. He obviously had other physical connections and emotional connections Mm -hmm. with people but he was like i don't want to spend the extra money to make this like yeah but i mean it's still a limitation right he can only have certain connections to like a certain level of degree and then it couldn't go beyond that because he was so obsessed with not spending money but his uncle is even more of a tragedy right. to me here. I, I mean, his mom le- legit starved. I know they say it might be fake, but I'm like, I feel like she starved. <laughs> I, I think that if your compulsions become that bad, um, mm-hmm. I definitely think that you could push yourself Especially to a point of starvation. Being a woman at that time and having your husband die mm-hmm. and worrying about money in that sense as well. Right. Like. I don't know if she was out doing her own thing or, you know, how that worked back then. The 1700s doesn't seem that far away about women weren't allowed to own property yet, were they? Right. Yeah. And I think another piece of it, too, is that they emphasized a lot back then, you know, familial wealth. Right. In order to keep your lands and titles or whatever else, you have to maintain this familial wealth and whereas you know in america today we're like ah well you know i hope to have some money to leave my family but if not it's america they can get a job but i think we should as americans we should focus more on setting our families and our offspring for success because they didn't ask to be here (laughs) (laughs) no one asked to be born at least don't make it hard on them well it's kind of true and that's probably why we have such a large wealth gap divide because people that are at the top know how to hoard the money right and the rest to us don't we so. need to be more scrooge like but like eat food that's is that the lesson of the story in the right exp- yeah just don't starve to death i feel like the capricorn lesson of the story is that you should scrooge and hoard your money better i don't think you should hoard <laughs> i feel like you should spend your money wisely i feel you don't need all of those you don't need all those look at yourself do you need that you don't <laughs> you need that five dollar starbucks and that you donut. don't just you because don't. it's pumpkin season do you really just because need that? it's do you need all those scarves do you need 60 pairs of shoes you don't 
See, I used to feel that way, but I'm going to give the opposite opinion where I feel like you don't need money at all and you don't need money to retire and you don't need to save money because YOLO, you only live once. And yes, if you want that donut, eat that donut, girl. Don't do that. <laughs> spend, spend your five dollars on that donut. I mean, spend your five. Like, if you, you want to take spend that money to the grave, live you your can. life. You could die tomorrow. You could have a really awesome tombstone. All I right. drove to the graveyard that, the other day. <laughs> and with that, we hope that you guys Sorry. have a wonderful Christmas. And we're going to sign off now. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy um, holidays. If you want to, like, give me anything, I prefer money. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. I will take um, a handcrafted piece of art. With money inside of it. With money inside. I do like money. But not enough to hoard it. I wouldn't hoard. I mean... I'm not saying I want to hoard money. I just want to have enough money that I don't have to make any more money. And yeah. then I just live off of that I money. I think that's the goal. Because we all want to make enough money. But that's not the point of Christmas. The point of Christmas is to spread cheer and love and joy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Positivity. Kindness. Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. Be kind to one another. Be kind to each other. Show, show, tell your family you love them right now, you know? Yeah, don't be Especially a Especially the bug. uncles and aunties that have a, a massive fortune that you can, that you can procure. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want to and you have an aunt or uncle who's like six generations down or whatever, send me their information. I'll be their niece. Yeah. But seriously, on a more mental health note, if you are struggling with some hoarding disorder, um feeling like you have to keep a hold of things and you just don't know how to begin to let go we hope that you find some help that you reach out there's some really great um, therapists out there that specialize in hoarding and um, even if it's money it doesn't necessarily mean that it's positively affecting your life so please reach out and look into that so you don't end up on our show, show. bye, bye. Hey guys, Crystal here. I really hope you guys enjoyed our Ebenezer Scrooge episode and are going to have a fabulous Christmas. Just remember that a lot of people out there this year are struggling with mental health and it's an important time to check in on those that you love. Please reach out, um, call any of the local mental health hotlines. You can call 211 and they can help you out with that. If you feel like you're experiencing any kind of suicidality or anything else for the holidays, please reach out. If you are looking for something to do while the rest of your family is laying around napping for turkey please check out our social media page on facebook at mental myths and mysteries or on insta at mental mysteries to see local art from around the world and pick up a custom piece for christmas we hope you have a wonderful holiday from the triple m cast team